Hi, I'm Zivi Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Jacqueline Alness is the author of The Fruit Care, the story of extreme wellness turned sour. Jacqueline is a writer, runner, and professor. Her essays and interviews have been published in the New York Times, Boston Globe, Women's Running, Electric Literature, and more. The Fruit Cure is her first book. Welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss The Fruit Cure, the story of extreme wellness turned sour. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. For listeners, FYI, there are shelves of books, The Fruit Cure, behind Jacqueline in this Zoom, and on one shelf is a stuffed banana with a a (laughs) smiley face on it. I got really into the fruit themed like <laughs> accessories for this. It's kind of fun. <laughs> well, you start your book off with the 30 banana, one banana a day, 30 day, whatever situation. Yeah. So that's, um, uh, that's a, it's a good place to start. Why don't you tell listeners what your book is about? I guess the title might be misleading. It sounds like I'm going to pitch you on like a wellness diet, but I'm not. I'm going to do the opposite. (laughs) When I was in college, I was a division one runner. And after my first semester, which was successful, I started experiencing mysterious neurological symptoms. I collapsed on the track. I started having blurry vision, dizziness. I started repeating words without apparent cause and losing my memory of events, which was obviously... Any 18-year-old would be kind of upset about that, but I think especially when you're used to being in total command of your body, it was really unsettling to all of a sudden be in a place where I felt like I didn't even know what it meant to live in my body anymore and how to, you know, regain some sort of control or joy in my own form. And I was sick for a year and then I got a little bit better and then I hoped it was over, but then I got really sick again. This is where the bananas come in and (laughs) I was at this stage in my treatment journey where I was waiting for a bed in the epilepsy ward to open. And I did what probably all of us do, which is when you're experiencing symptoms and you're anxious, you turn to Google, which for better or worse, gives us answers. And for me, it led me to a website called 30bananasaday.com. And I got just obsessed with this diet, or actually I got obsessed with the group of fruitarians who just ate fruit preached that eating raw fruit could cure you from anything. And I didn't ever become a fully blown fruitarian, but I started to believe that if I changed my way of eating, I could heal myself in some way. And <laughs> and, and now you're a hundred percent. What's the, what's the PS? What's like the, how do you feel now today? Okay. So yeah, I mean, the story is that, I mean, the, the book takes you through the the diet, I never became fruitarian. I never fell for it fully, but I became sort of obsessive about that. And so my journey after that, where I am now is a totally different place. I am in a place where everything is more balanced. Running, I I run competitively still, but I only do it when I'm having fun and I do it with people that I really love and care about. I eat. <laughs> I went to see a dietitian finally, like 10 years after this, and we sort of <laughs> unraveled together how I think all of us can be affected by this, the way that food can become, I think, especially socially and culturally, a measure of morality, something that's tied to emotions, something that's tied to your sense of well-being and your perception of yourself and sort of untangling those with a professional who did have a degree in what she was, you know, (laughs) talking about and not just a website was really helpful for me and better understanding my relationship to that. So overall, and yeah, my health issues, I've, I've found a great doctor. So overall, I'm thriving now. So the book was kind of a look back at, you know, what might have been different had I known now, had I known then, but I know now. And was it ever diagnosed 
this is like spoiling, you know, spoilers here, but (laughs) it wasn't ever diagnosed what was causing everything and the neurological symptoms. Yeah. It's like, they call it like migraine seizure variant. So it's, it's just sort of the brain is a mystery and sometimes. And so I do have these episodes that, you know, different doctors have classified as different things. We haven't caught one on a EEG machine. So it's not like definitively something, which is something I write about in the book, just the difficulty of when you don't have an exact name for something, finding peace in understanding that you can still reach a place of wellness and still reach a place in yourself where you feel comfortable in the world, which is what my goal always was. And so I feel happy that I'm there. That's amazing. Well, I have to say you are a spectacular author. Like I love the way you write. I mean, I know you started the saying, this isn't really like a health and wellness book, but it's (laughs) written like, like a beautiful memoir. You know, it's, it's much more memoir style writing. Can I just read even the beginning? Oh, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to read, not the Genesis chapter, although that was hilarious. (laughs) The book starts with like a riff on the Bible, essentially. (laughs) Adam and Eve and, you know, you know, I'm just going to read the first couple paragraphs to give people a, a taste of how great you write. Chapter one is called The First Fall. A few years before my fling with fruit, I was a freshman in college, a division one athlete. In the beginning, coach said, run. So I did. I ran eight miles easy, 400 repeats, long runs on Sundays, 1200s at a steady clip. I ran anything coach wanted. I ran through rain, through cold, through illness, and through the ache of too many miles. I ran to meet pain and I ran to escape from it. I ran to whittle myself into the number on a clock faster and faster each time until coach said what I had done was good. Even then I wanted more. In my wanting, my body betrayed me. And then you go into what happened and how you blinked and all of that dizziness and how you even still went back to running the next day. And, you know, good for you. I mean, you've got more motivation. I can't run and I'm perfectly healthy. It's like (laughs) you're like doing it against all odds. So, but I just love like the cadence of your writing. And I don't know. So is writing it another thing that has been something, a through line in your life or something you've been interested in forever or how, like, how did this become a book or did you yeah. know it would be a book? Give me the whole story. Yeah. So, and thank you, by the way, I really appreciate you. You know, the, the cadence thing is nice to hear. Yeah. I think for me, writing has always been something I've loved. I have these journals from when I was a kid. And in one of them, I just found it the other day, I think I was like 13 and I wrote, my dream someday we had to decide in English class and I I want to be a writer, but I don't think I'm good enough to ever get published. And oh. I, I looked back at it when uh, the book came out in Australia a, a month ago, I think. And it was just a really like, I think a lot of writers and a lot of people struggle with that kind of confidence because I think writing is something that you can never quite quantify the same way that you can quantify like a run is this time and you ran this many miles and you you sort of like have a measure of how you are. And so for me, it's been a journey to find that piece. And like, even if I can't quantify it, do I think that I've done what I can with what I have in this time? And that's been nice. But yeah, I think, you know, writing this book I wrote, I went, I did my MFA in Oregon and I did my PhD in Oklahoma. And throughout those years, I was writing about these neurological experiences and just trying to figure out what it meant to me and trying to figure out why, you know, why my life sort of went the way it did in terms of like my relationship with running, my relationship to food, my relationship to other people. All of that was really shaped by the episodes that I had in college. And it, what it was at one point a memoir just about my running mm. and it didn't sell that way and i'm kind of uh-huh. glad that it didn't sell that way a lot of people were like it was a little too quiet it didn't really have like the inspirational ending that we might expect in a sports story like i wasn't like you know i've triumphed i'm great now i've you know done great things but so in that after it didn't sell i started thinking like okay well what would my next project be what am i obsessed with and i've always been weirdly obsessed with this fruit group where I, you know, have lived a normal life. I'm not like part of a cult. I'm not, you know, in this community. I've just always been a lurker. And I've always asked myself, like, why am I obsessed? Why have I followed, even if tangentially, these people for a decade now of my life? And what about that obsesses me? And so I think getting to the fruit allowed me to understand a lot more about myself and feel a lot less lonely with my own story because I think the interviews I did for the book helped me feel like other people feel exactly the same way I do too. And other people have sought exactly what I have when they've been in places of desperation with their health or with their bodies or just 
feeling like they want more. So that was great. Well, it's no surprise. You know, there's this raw food, as you point out, raw food, whole food movement, right? There's this backlash against all the chemicals and processed foods and everything that it's not even food that we eat all the time. And how obviously as a society, our health is deteriorating at the same time as our food is becoming more processed. You just have to look to other countries to see like, okay, well, you know, like why right. can't we go on vacation in Italy and right. like lose weight? You know, what the heck? What's going on? And right. eating the same foods, you know, why is the chocolate chip cookie my grandmother made like now, even with the same ingredients? Because the flour is processed so differently now than it was back then. So all of these things. So it's no, it's not like a huge shock that there would be a group of people who would turn to either fruits or vegetables. But I think the question is why only fruit versus like, Why do they pick only fruit versus fruit and vegetables? Or what characterizes the group of people who follow this movement? Yeah, so I think something that I started to notice, because what I did was I I asked myself, like, who is the first person to, to pitch the idea of eat 30 bananas a day? Just because I think it's absurd on its face value. When you say it out loud, people are like, excuse me, what? And I actually thought you meant 30 a month. And I was like, no, it's a day, a day. So when you wake up, you put 10 bananas in a blender, you drink it, you do the same thing at lunch and dinner. And they believed. So, so for me, I was like, yeah, who, who pitched this? And other people were like, yes, I'll do that. And what I ended up finding was I did a lot of historical research for this. So I found, for example, a woman in South Africa named Essie Honabal, who wrote a memoir called I Live on Fruit. And her story was weirdly parallel to mine and that she was a former competitive swimmer. She was like at the peak of health. She was a health and fitness lecturer at a college. So you would think she has all this like scientific knowledge about the body. She has this awareness of her body, but she got sick with tuberculosis. And then after that, trusted a 76 year old man when she was in her thirties to, who told her eat fruit and only fruit. And she went for it. And so I then like looked at him. And so I like, long story short, you can read in the book, obviously, but long story short, the fruit diet came from this weird blend of like Christianity, which is why I start the story with Genesis, where there was this belief in purity and this want for purity. And this idea that if you purified yourself from toxins or the evils of the world or your own wants, your body would be better and you would be healthier. And so it was really fascinating to see that the same thing that was being preached in the early 1900s is now on YouTube, just in a different, (laughs) sexier format. It's like, we really haven't changed that much. And so there are no new ideas in the world. Right. Like it it was really wild. It looked like an Instagram ad. Some of the stuff that I would read for like these health cures from the (laughs) 1900s where you're like, wait a second. I just was pitched that yesterday in like an Instagram (laughs) ad. Like I, I think I'm living in the same time period. So it was like, that's why I say it was like comforting to know that like humans, you know, we're really, we're really similar. And then also being able to say, well, if this is an idea that people came up with in the early 1900s based in no science and based in this version of morality that maybe doesn't align with my own beliefs, then why would I want to pursue it? And like, how does that sort of shape how you're able to see yourself and your own desires and realize that some of it is so shaped culturally that we don't even notice it anymore. But if you take a second to look, you realize that this is all coming from somewhere. It's not just a fad diet, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so who is the book for? That's a great question. You know, I think probably in some ways it's for me, of a younger <laughs> version of me. I think when I was younger, especially as an athlete. And this this is something I think about a lot. When you talk about like the beginning chapter that you read where I kept trying to run, even though I was so sick, I think there's a real, again, cultural push that I experienced where it's like a no pain, no gain Mm -hmm. experience when you're an athlete, especially when you're trying to compete at a higher level of like, how much pain can you take before you succumb to it? And you're weak if you succumb to that pain. And what I wanted to write it for was partially for that younger athlete who I want to say to my younger self, like rest, be a little bit softer, know that athletics can be a lifelong journey if you give yourself permission to go through the ebbs and flows that will come with puberty, with life changes, with grief, with injury, with the million things that life brings to all of us. And so in part, I wrote it to say, you know, like, 
take a step back from the extremes and live in that place of softness a little bit more. And then also wrote it for, I think people who are chronically ill or people who love people who are chronically ill, who are a lot of people in this world. I myself had a really hard time loving myself when I was sick. I had a hard time accepting my body and who I was. And I didn't want to believe that I would be sick forever. I wanted to believe that like someday it would miraculously just leave me and I would return to this division one athlete self, which obviously never happened. But I think in experiencing a health crisis at such a young age, it's made me a lot more tender toward other people who are experiencing things with their bodies that are sometimes unnameable or sometimes hard to experience express or describe. And so I hope that other people take that away as well. That's great. That's beautiful. So after the book was, you know, all done with the publisher, blah, blah, blah. Like, what did you do then? And what are you doing now? (laughs) Oh man, it's been like a roller coaster. (laughs) This is my first book. So, and I teach university. So I tell them all the time, like when they turn in We just had our nonfiction unit, for example. And when they turned in their essays, they all came to class expressing this like deep sense of vulnerability and this fear of their peers reading their work and this fear of not being understood. And I was happy to be able to stand in front of the room and tell them like, you know, a decade after being where you are and me putting a book out, I feel the exact same way. It doesn't (laughs) go away. I don't think there's a place where you feel as a writer where you're like, 100% 100% I am ready. You know, like you you always have this sense, this warring sense within yourself of like, you have done the best you can. And then also this want and hope that someone out there gets it. And so I think what I've been taking from this process is just like sitting with the beautiful moments that have come out of it, like conversations like this one, where you get to talk to someone who understands, you know, part of your experience and wants to see more of it or gives you the space to be able to see it, I think is a really amazing thing. And just like the work that publishers do, which I know is work you know well, of the the, the effort it takes to bring a book from a kernel of an idea to wanting to share it with other people is something that I'll never take for granted. So that's all been good. And then also just wrestling with the anxiety of like, oh my goodness, I I wrote this and it's going into the world now. (laughs) Like it's not mine anymore. (laughs) I think so many authors have anxiety. I think it's like one of the, the ways in which the way you see the world is framed and there are so many questions all the time that it helps to write. So anyway, right. it's, so many, it's something that they, the authors share for a, a good reason. Right. But then there's always the moment where it's like, oh my gosh, and now it's completely out of my control. Like right. It's, right. it's being like, on, it, it's like on trucks. My story right. is like on trucks <laughs> being like thrown in a box onto like the doorstep of a bookstore and there's nothing I can do about it. Like I can't take it back. Exactly. It's, it's out there. I don't even know where. And I, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's terrifying. It's totally terrifying. Yeah, but I will. <laughs> it's all part of the ride. But honestly, I think if you write from the heart, which is what you did, and if you share the parts of yourself that, you know, are not the parts that you might see at a cocktail party, right? But the real parts and the real backstory, people can't help but connect with that because that's, they're bringing their whole selves to every book that they read, right? Right. We come at it with all of our own experience. So what a relief to have to not, not to have to sort of come through the mess to find the real story, right? Yeah. It's, and it's so true. And it's those moments where you get to meet another person in their realness too, which I think is the best part of it. You know, like they're, like you said, it's not a cocktail party where you're exchanging pleasantries. You're getting to the heart of other people and letting people do that for you, which I think is the best part of being a human, honestly, is are those real moments. It's, It's so true. Oh my gosh. Are you working on a new book? I am not yet. I hope to. Or you never want to write another book. The rest yeah, exactly. Of your life. You're like, <laughs> I caught you in the phase where no, yeah. I have ideas that are pinging around. I think it's been an effort that's taken my whole self to kind of bring this one out. And I also, I teach four or five classes a semester. So that also oh takes a lot of my heart and a lot of my energy. And so I'm waiting for that little blip maybe this summer when I have some time to really just be in my own head again and kind of see what happens. So I'm excited. I'm excited for that time. It'll be good. 
Well, I'm glad you've put your overachiever self to bed, you know. Yes. I'm glad you're not still doing things like that anymore. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. It's part of the balancing thing I'm learning where it's like everything has its time and everything will, you know, it it will happen when it happens. What are the classes you're teaching now? I teach uh, a mixture of, I teach some like comp classes, like writing 120, which is always fun because I get them on their first day of college, which I always love because I get to kind of break down the barrier that it's going to be this like scary, intimidating writing space. And they always say like, yeah, it wasn't so bad, which is my goal at the end of the semester. And then I teach nonfiction. I teach creative writing classes. And that's another joy because you see these students just stepping into themselves in such brave and beautiful ways and just trying things. Like they remind me to play. I think the more you know about publishing and the more you're kind of aware of what's expected or what does a proposal look like or what does it mean to sell a book, they bring me back to the joy of just like, let's create. I have this weird idea. Let me try it out. And they, it, it's really amazing to get to be a part of that and witness that and see them change over the four years that I get to work with them sometimes. So I really love that. That's wonderful. Is there a part of the book that you're particularly like, oh gosh, maybe I shouldn't put that in? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. A lot of it like you said, are things that I really don't talk about very often. And so that part, just thinking about an array of different people who are in my life, reading that and knowing that part of me is scary, but also I think exciting. I think something that I recognized in my healing journey over the years is that the more you do open up, the more you realize that other people will meet you where you are and they want to love you where you are. And so I think that this book has been a step, like a huge step toward that and toward saying like, this is my story and, you know, this is who I am, even though there are a bunch of other parts of me floating around out there where, you know, I'm not always thinking about this stuff or thinking about these memories. It's just a part of my life. But yeah, I think like I have a lot of something that was really fun for me is I guess the the losing of the team was a really painful part of my life, like leaving the team and I write about in the book how my teammates were cruel sometimes when I was experiencing my episodes, which was really difficult to reconcile. And what's been a really beautiful part of my life has been finding a group of adults who meet at track on Tuesdays and Fridays mornings at 5.15. And it's so fun to be part of that kind of team again and be comfortable running with other people, finding joy in the pursuit of these goals we have for ourselves, even though no one else is expecting anything of us. And just knowing that another person's going to meet you in the dark, I think. So I think that's that's something I'm excited for is for them to know. I think they know how much they mean to me, but I don't think they know the parts of my story that are the reason why they mean so much to me. So I'm excited for that. Feeling like this might be a good holiday gift for the runners. Yeah. In the morning. <laughs> Could just show up, you know, scatter yeah, them just out. hand them out. Yeah, hand them out, see if that changes the dynamic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love what you just said, though, about meeting in the dark. It's about the story and it's about when you run and I don't right. know. Right. Write like a little essay or something of yeah. know, the group and how it, you know, it's helped you through or I don't know. Yeah. So what do you like to read and why did you pursue an MFA? Yeah. <laughs> MFA, PhD. This is like nuts. You're it, like, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Go back there and also, yeah, the whole literary inspiration and all that. Yeah. So when I was in college, I took my first creative writing class my second year when I was having a really rough time emotionally. I had just left the team. I was feeling super unmoored and really sad a lot of the time. And like, I didn't know who I was. And I remember taking that class and feeling like, oh, like I like this. And I remember having that same sort of draw to it that I had toward running at first where you're like, I don't know why I like this, but I'll stay up all night revising a poem to see what it looks like. And remembering that sense of joy that comes with like creation, even though you don't know what's coming next. And so the MFA was basically, I wanted to just learn. I felt like I had, you know, just scratched the surface of what I wanted to write and think about. And I couldn't get this story out of my head. Like I could not write about anything but this neurological stuff, which is when you ask about another book, I'm very excited to have, you know, told this story so that I can be sort of like done with it for a while. But yeah, that that was another space of a learning. I had a great advisor who would, I would just, he would have a policy where I could meet him every Friday so long as I sent him pages by Wednesday. And I was probably the most annoying advisee because I would send him pages every Wednesday and be like, hey, I'm here again. But he was just such a great mentor and would always just 
you know, take my story and give me feedback, which I really appreciated. But yeah, in terms of reading, I mean, I love so much. I'm in a deep novel obsession right now, I think because I'm so inundated by nonfiction. But I just read a recent one I read was Wellness. And I loved that book just because it's obsessed with similar things like the placebo effect. And what does it mean that relationships change over time as you change your relationship with yourself? I'm totally blanking. I just read The School for Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan, which I really loved. That took me out of my grading fugue state and into such a fascinating critique of our current world. So yeah, that's what I'm into lately. I had Jessamine Chan on the podcast about that book. I really liked that book. It's so good. Yeah. I like it when, you know, you say even the name of the book and I immediately have like the whole scene, you know, like I can, yes. I can yes. explain, like it's a scene in a movie and I can just like see the whole thing, you know? Yes. The uh, blue liquid, the lab coats. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Well, wellness. I don't know. People have such mixed feelings and feel very strongly about their feelings about this book. I have not read it and clearly I'm going to have to get on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really, it made me think a lot, which is, which I really love. And then I got to talk to him and it was just a real pleasure to get to like dive into all of the, like he did a lot of research on the algorithm. And so thinking about loneliness and the ways that these social media platforms are pulling us together in theory, but in reality, it's like this very cold sort of pulling together in some ways and the ways that we can resist that. So I really liked thinking about those things with him. It was really great. Have you read Running Home by Katie Arnold? No, but it's on my shelf. It is? I okay. To, yeah. I want to introduce yeah. you to, because I feel like you would have a great, like, that's like a event I would want to go to. to I would love that. So let me yeah. introduce you. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. She's awesome. Anyway. Okay. Advice for aspiring authors. It's a great question. I, I say show up for yourself, show up to the page, which I think is advice a lot of people give, but I think including myself. I can use that encouragement a lot. I I guess this is the advice I give to my students. And then I say to myself, like, are you following it? Which is, I tell (laughs) them just like, show up and see what happens and don't be afraid of a bad draft. Don't be afraid of just like trying something for the sake of trying it and knowing that it doesn't have to go anywhere. You just wrote it down. That's okay. And so I think that's advice I need to give to myself too, especially in this space of now that one book is done, what happens next? Allowing myself the permission to write something terrible and not have it be published, but just get into that habit of like, what do I love? What story is in my mind that I can't stop thinking of? What do I want to try that I might fail at, but it's okay if I do? Like, how can I pursue that? I think is is something I would encourage people and not to be afraid to reach out to others. A lot of people a lot of other writers, a lot of editors have been super, super helpful in my writing journey. And I only got there because I reached out to them on a whim and they responded back with such kindness. And so I try to pay that forward. And I try to tell people like, you know, people want to be in community. And so reaching out is never a bad thing. I love it. Do you still eat fruit? And if so, do you have a favorite fruit? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I I do eat a banana a day, but just one. So, okay. you know, we're we're good there. And my favorite fruit would probably be jackfruit. <laughs> and if it's good, you know, it's got to be I feel like I I grew up part of my life in Indonesia and I I got like the best jackfruit. So now when I see it in the store, I'm tempted and usually sometimes I'll buy it, but it's sometimes like the US supermarket version of jackfruit, so it's not quite the same, but I do love that. It's my favorite. Wow. Where do you live, by the way? Where do you live now? I live in Pennsylvania. I live like 45 minutes outside of Philadelphia. Oh my gosh. All right. Awesome. Well, hopefully we'll meet in person at some point. I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm super excited. I think Hereafter is coming out from Zibby Books. I'm so excited. I love Amy's newsletter so much. It's like one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. So I'm like counting down until I can get a copy. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. uh, It's beautiful. It's, I can imagine. And it's also, I wonder if I have it right here. I should have it right here because I had everything organized this weekend. And spent, okay, wait, I have it. I'm going to show you really quickly. Hold on. So this is it, but she did the inside. So every page is like, it's almost like poetry. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So I anyway. love it. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. You should interview her somewhere. We should. Anyway, we'll make yeah. something happen. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. (laughs) All right. Well, Jacqueline, thank you so much. And thanks for coming on. I'm totally impressed by you. You're like so articulate, poised, and it's like, I don't know. I'm like, that was really like 
refreshing. I feel like I just went for like a walk <laughs> in the park or something. <laughs> I really can't thank you enough. I've been so excited for this and Aww. yeah, I'm just like thrilled to be here. So thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. So All right. Bye. Have a great day. <laughs> okay. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 